Hello, this is Dr. Reed Schufer. I've developed this presentation to help pet owners gain a better understanding of spinal injuries in their pets. If after viewing this presentation you have follow-up questions, please feel free to contact me at 909-980-3575 or email me at arphweb at altaranchopet.com. Before we begin discussing spinal cord injuries, I will review the basics of the structure of the spinal column, the anatomy and function of the intervertebral disc, and the anatomy and function of the spinal cord. This overview should help you understand how spinal cord injuries affect your pet and what we can do to treat them. The spinal column is formed by a number of bones called vertebra. These individual bones are joined together to form a protective tunnel or canal in which the spinal cord is protected. Each pair of bones is separated by a semi-flexible cushion called the intervertebral disc. This disc allows the spinal cord to bend and flex without losing its integrity. When two vertebra come together, they form an opening called the intervertebral foramen. It is through these openings that spinal nerves leave the spinal cord and enter the tissue that they supply. The spinal column consists of five separate regions. The column begins as it attaches to the skull and forms the cervical or neck portion of the column. This section consists of seven bones. The next section is the thoracic or chest section, which consists of 13 bones, each of which has ribs attached to it to form the bony chest cavity. The next section of the seven bones is the lumbar section or lower back. The lumbar section is followed by the sacral section, which consists of three bones which are fused together. The sacrum attaches the spinal cord to the pelvic girdle and hence the legs. The final section is the coccygeal or tail section and is composed of 20 to 21 vertebra. The intervertebral disc gets its name because inter means between and vertebral refers to the vertebra. Thus, it is the disc between the vertebra. It is composed of a tough outer surface called the annulus fibrosus, which surrounds the compressible center called the nucleus pulposus. When a disc is damaged, the material from the nucleus nucleus pulposus and some of the annulus fibrosus may be spewed into the spinal canal and damage the spinal cord. It can also shoot into the intervertebral foramen and put pressure on the spinal nerve located there causing pain and or dysfunction. The spinal cord connects the brain to the rest of the body. It consists of long cells that are comparable to electric wires. The nerves of the spinal cord are arranged in layers with the outer fibers being responsible for sensory information, such as location of the body parts and pain. Superficial damage to the spinal cord will thus create loss of knowledge of the position of your limbs and pain. The deeper fibers of the spinal column are the nerves that control the motor function of the limbs or their ability to move. If these fibers are damaged, your pet experiences reduction in or total loss of function of one or more limbs. The nerves of the spinal cord are fairly fragile and nature has provided the bony spinal column to protect them. When spinal nerves are damaged, they are slow to heal, if they heal at all. If the nerves are severed, they typically do not repair themselves and the pet may be left permanently paralyzed. The names of the section of the spinal cord are named in the same manner as the spinal column. Each section performs different functions. We can attempt to isolate where the injury is based on which functions are not working properly. Nerves coming out of the neck control the forelimbs. They also control the swallowing reflex. Damage to this area can result in reduced function in one or both forelimbs. Because all signals to the hind limbs must pass through the cervical region, it is possible to show reduced or loss of function in one or both hind limbs as well from a cervical injury. The nerves coming out of the thoracic region are responsible for bodily functions, the muscles of the ribs and the diaphragm. Nerves from the lumbar section control the hind limbs and abdominal organs. 
Injuries in this area can result in reduced or lost function in one or both hind limbs. Nerves from the low lumbar and sacral region control the bladder, rectal sphincter, and sex organs. Damage in this area can lead to fecal and or urinary incontinence or inability to urinate. There are three main ways in which the spinal cord can be injured. The most common is due to bulging or rupture of the intervertebral disc. Tumors can grow within the spinal cord or in the spinal canal or bones of the spinal column. These tumors can crush adjacent nerves, which leads to the loss of function. Trauma to the spine can result in fracture or dislocation of the vertebra and subsequent loss of function. Intervertebral disc bulging or rupture is the most common spinal injury. In certain breeds, the cartilage of the disc can become brittle prematurely and hence rupture more easily. This is seen most in dogs with short legs and long backs, such as the Dachshund, Basset Hound, Shih Tzu, and Lhasa Apso. Discs that are degenerated often accumulate calcium deposits in them and can be seen readily on radiographs as seen to the right of this slide at the arrow. When the disc bulges or ruptures, the material can enter the spinal column. The initial insult can cause the spinal cord to swell. Because the cord is in a solid canal, it can only swell so much. Then the pressure against it cause, causes injury and loss of function. Think of it like your foot swelling in a tight shoe. If the disc material enters the column, then it can be thought of as a pebble in the shoe, putting constant pressure on the cord. The degree to which the disc bulges or ruptures in the spinal canal determines the severity of the symptoms your pet is experiencing. Mild compression may cause your pet to walk wobbly or like they are drunk. This is due to the fact that the compression blocks the messages from the leg to the brain, letting it know where the pet is placing the limb. Mild compression is generally associated with difficulty getting up and down and pain, which can vary from intermittent to constant. More severe compression may lead to reduced function in one or more limbs, depending on the location of the disc rupture. Very severe compression will result in the loss of deep pain sensation, which yields a poor prognosis for recovery. Everyone asks, can I prevent intervertebral disc injury in my dog? We have discussed the breeds that are at high risk. However, these injuries can occur in all dogs. The most common reason for a disc to bulge or rupture is jumping. This can be as simple as jumping off a couch or small wall, jumping out of the car, or even going downstairs. If you have a high-risk breed, you should train your pet not to jump. Do not encourage activities that stress the spine, such as playing tug-of-war, frisbee, ball catching, or running around slippery surfaces like pools. The heavier your pet, the more likely they are to injure their spines, so strict ration control is essential to keep them as lean as possible as a means of prevention. Cancer is another reason for spinal cord injuries. Tumors can develop within the spinal cord itself, such as lymphoma. They can develop in tissues surrounding the spinal cord, such as the meningioma. Alternately, a tumor can develop in the bone of the spinal cord and cause damage, as in multiple myeloma or osteosarcoma. Regardless of the source of the tumor, as it grows and compresses or destroys parts of the spinal cord, loss of function will ensue. Damage to the bones of the spine generally occurs from trauma. This can be from falling, being hit by a car, getting into a fight with another animal. Fracture of a vertebra or partial or full dislocation of one of the vertebral joints invariably traumatizes the spine. If the spine is broken and dislocates, the spinal cord may be severed or severely injured. These type of traumatic lesions have to be addressed surgically and the prognosis is generally guarded to grave. Back injuries present to us with a variety of symptoms. Frequently, owners have no idea that their pet has sustained a spinal cord injury. They simply report things like, my dog is not acting right, he's hiding, doesn't want to eat, won't get up on the couch, wants me to carry him up the stairs. Frequently, owners report that the pet is crying out when being touched or picked up. This is due to the fact that when you lift the dog, you invariably bend the spine, which may cause sudden pain in a pet with a bulging disc. Oftentimes the symptoms are intermittent and may be seen only in certain circumstances as when the pet has to move in a certain fashion.
With more severe injuries, the symptoms become much more obvious. They include wobbly walking, which we call ataxia. This results from the message from the limb not reaching the brain, so the brain is not sure where to place the foot. Owners may notice knuckling of one or more feet when walking. Many times the pet appears lame in one or more limbs. This can occur if the nerves in charge of that leg are irritated. The pain may radiate down the limb and cause the pet to hold it up. As the injury gets worse, pets may drag one or more limbs, may not be able to get up, or may not be able to walk at all. Diagnosis of spinal cord injuries begin with the history from the owner. Behaviors mentioned above may give your veterinarian a clue that the spinal cord injury is at the root of the symptoms. Next, a thorough physical exam will help rule out any orthopedic bone or joint injury which may be causing the symptoms. Finally, a neurologic exam is performed to help localize the injury to a specific section of the spinal cord. Once a spinal cord injury is suspected, we turn to diagnostic imaging to find evidence of the problem. We generally start with radiography or x-rays because they are readily available and relatively inexpensive. Radiographs can easily tell us if there are mineralized and or collapsed discs. When a disc ruptures, it becomes thinner than the other discs and hence the distance between the vertebra that it separates becomes narrower as seen in this radiograph. X-rays are very useful to determine fractures, dislocations of the spine, as well as bone destroying tumors. If we cannot determine the location or nature of the injury with radiography, we turn to magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, or computerized tomography, CT scans. These modalities can tell us exact location of the injury, the nature of the injury, whether it is a disc, tumor, or fracture. You may be asking yourself, why don't we just jump to the MRI or CT scan? The reason is generally expense and availability. MRIs or CT scans require full anesthesia and may cost up to 10 times as much as radiography. Once we have our diagnosis or tentative diagnosis, we can begin treatment. The treatment modalities employed will vary with the severity of the symptoms. Pets who can walk but are experiencing pain may be treated with drugs, laser therapy, acupuncture, and or chiropractic ma manipulation. We generally employ either non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents such as meloxicam, carprofen, or Prevacox. NSAIDs reduce pain and inflammation. Steroids are more potent anti-inflammatory agents and may be employed instead of NSAIDs. Because steroids and NSAIDs can both upset GI tract and cause ulcers, they should never be used together. Pain relievers such as opioids or gabapentin are often added to improve pain control. Opioids block the pain receptors while gabapentin reduces the irritability of the nerve fibers and hence reduces pain. Cold therapeutic laser therapy is an effective modality to help treat spinal injury. The laser penetrates down to the spinal nerves and reduces inflammation, initiates and speeds up the body's own healing mechanisms, stimulates acupuncture points non-invasively, and reduces nerve irritability and hence pain. Generally, laser therapy is administered in a series of six to 10 treatments over two to three weeks. The prognosis for pets with spinal cord injuries who can still walk but have pain is generally very good. Rest and treatment with the modalities listed previously will most often get them back to normal function. However, owners must be aware that once a pet has a spinal injury, they will be prone to recurrence. Reducing risk factors such as jumping, playing ball, running on slick surfaces, and maintaining a lean body weight will help protect your pet from future occurrences. Pets with weakness in one or more limbs have a more guarded prognosis. However, they can frequently be tre successfully treated with non-surgical means. Owners must be vigilant to watch for worsening signs, such as dragging one or more legs or loss of pain sensation. If these things should occur while being treated with non-surgical means, surgery may have to be considered. Surgery must be considered for pets who are unable to walk or feel deep pain or if they are unable to manage the pet's pains adequately with non-surgical means. In order to have a successful outcome from surgery, 
you must choose a facility that has advanced imaging capacity, such as MRI or CT scanning available. You should seek out a surgeon who does a lot of spinal surgery and preferably a board certified neurosurgeon. The facility should have 24 hour nursing care to help your pet recover and ideally a rehabilitation department. We are fortunate that there are a number of such facilities that meet these criteria in our vicinity. Neurosurgery is fairly expensive and can offer no guarantees. However, if your pet is unable to walk and does not respond to non-surgical treatments, it may be the only hope for regaining mobility. Spinal surgery may range from five to $10,000 at the time of producing this presentation. The surgical techniques differ depending on the location of the spinal lesion, but essentially they are all geared to reduce the pressure on the spinal cord and to remove any compressive material whether it is from an intervertebral disc or whether it is from a tumor. The first step in surgery is to perform an MRI or CT scan to localize the lesion and determine the extent of it and whether it can be helped by surgery. Next, the surgeon will access the spinal cord by removing some of the bone surrounding it and remove the offending material. The release of pressure and removal of foreign material will give the spinal cord the best chance to heal. In the event of broken or dislocated vertebra, the surgeon will employ orthopedic techniques and implants to stabilize the bones if the spinal cord is assessed to be viable. After spinal surgery, rehabilitation techniques may be employed to speed up your pet's recovery. Modes employed <coughs> by rehabilitation centers may include cold therapeutic laser, hydrotherapy, acupuncture, and others. While rehab therapy adds to the expense, it has been shown to hasten the healing and return to function of pets undergoing spinal surgery. The outcome of spinal surgery is hard to predict. There are many factors affecting the outcome, including the location and severity of the spinal injury, the length of time that the pet has been experiencing loss of function, the physical condition of the pet going into surgery, the weight of the pet, as well as his age. If your pet is faced with having spinal surgery, the neurosurgeon will be better equipped to give you a prognosis for your own pet based on his or her specific uh, circumstances. Unfortunately, there can be no guarantees with spinal surgery. For many people, spinal surgery may not be a realistic alternative. In those cases, owners may opt to live with their pet as a disabled member of the family. This requires a big commitment by the owners, but can be very rewarding. There are companies that make custom devices to help disabled pets, and with their aid, the pets can still enjoy a happy life. In closing, spinal injuries are common problems in pets and can be successfully treated with non-surgical and surgical means. Early detection and diagnosis of the injury are essential for a successful outcome. Thank you for listening. If you have further questions, feel free to contact me by phone or email.